Okay, doke. So we're now approaching the end of the lecture course. We have two to go, including this one. And because we've now, I, I think to a large extent, explored many of the, the structural aspects of the standard model, how it's constructed, uh, what are the ingredients, the gauge symmetries, what uh, comes out of it, things like approximate symmetries and so on. And we're now in a position, aren't armed or equipped with all that information to um, start to explore a little bit more broadly the corners of the standard model. And there's one corner of the standard model which I think is fascinating and I think is uh, an area of the standard model that teaches us an enormous amount about the laws of nature. And this is to do with physics below the QCD scale. So the physics of things like pions and kaons and so on. And it's a fascinating and rich topic, and it has many, many deep connections with the physics in the, the UV, which is the, the, the standard model particles that you would know, like quarks and gluons and things like this. And many of the lessons that we've learned so far will actually, uh, actually crop up in a, in a different form, but it's the same fundamental principles when we study uh, physics below the QCD scale. This all, though, um, uh, connects back to the end of the last lecture. And the end of the last lecture was really concerning this notion of asymptotic freedom, which is that as you go to very high energies, the effective uh, gauge coupling in QCD becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And that has a flip side. When you turn that on its head, that means as you go to lower energies, the gauge coupling becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And this has many consequences. So just quickly, we'll discuss the the consequences of asymptotic freedom. Uh, one of the first is that uh, perturbation theory is no longer applicable. It's invalid. And the reason for that is quite simple. When we calculate using perturbation theory, the tool, we can't just calculate um, physical processes uh, at arbitrarily high precision. So we have to use, you know, straight out of the pathological, we have to use some sort of uh, approach, some sort of approximation to get a hand handle on things where we can actually calculate. And that's what we do, what perturbation theory is. Perturbation theory is not a fundamental concept. It is not um, a property of nature, but it is, uh, uh, a tool that we use to calculate. And perturbation theory is, an expansion, is essentially an expansion in the fine structure constant. So we know for, for QED, that's you know, alpha, which is E squared over four pi. And once that expansion parameter stops being small, then perturbation theory is, break down, is breaking down and we can't use it anymore because in perturbation theory, we you know, might just keep the first term at that order or maybe the, the first two terms, or maybe if we're really smart, the first three terms. But if there's no rationale for believing that they are more important than, for example, the 17th term or the 1,500th term, then we don't learn anything from those first few orders in perturbation theory. And so when the, the QCD coupling becomes strong in the IR, which means at low energies and long distance scales, then um, uh, we can no longer use perturbation theory. That doesn't mean the path integral is broken down, though. So you can, for instance, put the whole path integral on a computer and do lattice gauge theory and calculate things, um, <clears throat> but perturbation theory isn't going to work. The second is that quarks and gluons essentially uh, bind together. Um, <clears throat> and that's because the gauge coupling has become stronger and stronger and stronger, and, it, and then it gets harder and harder to pull them apart. And so they have become bound together into things like mesons and protons. And this is related to the notion of um, uh, confinement. There's no such thing, you know, you can, there's no, when, when you're talking about very long distance scales, larger than the size of a proton, there's no such thing as a gluon. A gluon only makes sense in the sort of the perturbative picture that we have for the standard model. A gluon only, gluon only makes sense when you're talking about distance scales much shorter than the proton. In the proton sort of Compton wavelength. We're talking about longer distances, which is equivalently low energies. There's not even a notion with which a gluon exists. And that's related to confinement. You know, because of confinement, we, uh, long distances, the, the physical entities, the things that enter into physical processes 
are things like pions and kaons and protons and neutrons, the rho meson, and so on, but not quarks and gluons. And then the final, uh, the final property uh, or, or implication of asymptotic freedom is a phenomenon which is very general. And, and for me, as a, as a, a theoretical physicist, um, really extraordinarily beautiful. And this is um, known as dimensional tra transmutation. And conceptually, it's nothing more than I've already been telling you. Um, but it is a general phenomenon which um, uh, uh, can occur. So on the x, on the y-axis here, I've got the strong, the strong fine structure constant, which I'm calling alpha s. And on the x-axis, I've got um, the scale at which um, you might be calculating things. Okay, so on the x-axis is the scale, so the energy scale, or uh, or conversely, the inverse uh, 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 distance scale. <clears throat> and because the, the uh, coupling is running, at high energies it's small, at low energies it's big, and when the strong coupling becomes too big, which is sort of around um, the, the QCD, the sort of proton mass and things like that, it becomes uh, uh, strongly coupled. And technically speaking, in perturbation theory, the gauge coupling, you know, if you're just working at low sort of perturbation theory, so you can't really trust that this is just a, a, a rough sort of schematic picture. The gauge coupling essentially becomes sort of infinite um, at some order in perturbation theory at scales uh, around like 330 or so. Uh, if, you, if you do an MS bar scheme, something like 330 MeV. This is the scale where, uh, the scale where QCD is becoming strongly coupled. So what has happened here? So imagine, so let's, let's think just about QCD and not the whole rest of the theory. Um, so this thing about QCD, QCD in itself is classically scale invariant. The, 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 the only coupling in town is the gauge coupling and the gauge coupling does not carry any mass dimension. It does, you know, the, it is a coupling, so it enters in a particular way uh, relating to H bars and things like this, but it does not contain any mass dimension. And yet, um, when we run down, so at high energies, there's no fundamental parameter that contains mass dimension. Yet, by nature of by the nature of asymptotic freedom, when we run down to low energies, a mass scale is actually dynamically generated. There is a physical mass scale in nature that comes out of QCD, and it's related to the proton mass, essentially proton, neutron, and all those particles. So a, a mass scale, a dimensionful scale, is actually generated out of a theory that fundamentally has no dimension for parameters. And that's a purely quantum mechanical property. That would not have happened if there weren't quantum mechanics and there wasn't the H bar. And it's sort of a very magical thing because um, theories with no scales in them are very, very uh, uh, special and also quite ubiquitous. And it shows us that mass parameters themselves are not necessarily fundamental uh, entities, fundamental quantities. And they can arise just as a result of, of quantum mechanical evolution. And this is something that was sort of, I think, brought to, to great attention by, by Coleman and Weinberg uh, in, a, in, in papers studying things like um, quantum electrodynamics with charged scalars and things like this. But it's a rather general phenomenon that can occur, and it, it occurs in nature, in the world we live in. Okay. Um, So now, so, so those are sort of the broad implications of um, asymptotic freedom. And there they are, uh, I've, put them, I've got them in my notes here. I wrote, this is a big deal, it is a big deal. Um, but now let's try and take those, consequent, those, those, those implications and run with them a little bit. And the, the first thing I want to discuss is something known as quark condensation. And uh, so what do I mean by quark condensation? So this is in relation to things like uh, 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 mesons. So we'll study the, the meson sector and pretty much the whole time, actually, we're just gonna discuss pi, when we discuss mesons, we'll just uh, discuss pions. Okay, so due to strong coupling, the quarks and the anti-quarks will, will actually bind together. So there, there, there are quarks and anti-quarks and the exchange of gluons is so strong that they actually bind together. And in fact, they bind together so strongly that they actually condense. Now, what do I mean by condense? 
Um, what I mean by that is that essentially there's a non-zero expectation value to find something with the same quantum numbers as a QQ bar pair everywhere. Just like the Higgs has an expectation value throughout the universe, so too do QQ bar pairs. So the, the, the expectation value, which I use these um, brackets for, you might hear it described as the, the VEV, the vacuum expectation value, um, is non-zero everywhere. And this has, this has big consequences. It's not something, this is something that we see in quantum field theories all the time. Um, it's related to, to the same similar physics as electroweak symmetry breaking, but now what has happened is, is driven by a different phenomenon. So when we studied the Higgs sector, we just had some, what we would call a perturbative model, where we have some Higgs potential with a cortic and we get this Mexican hat thing. And we can do everything essentially almost classically, um, without having to worry about the quantum mechanics too much because the, the fine structure constant is small, the correct quantum corrections are small, and so on. Here it's totally different. We start off with a theory that has small couplings. It goes to a regime where there's a big coupling. And in that regime, we generate, uh, uh, or the world, the universe generates a vacuum expectation value for QQ bar pairs. Um, <clears throat> this is also not something that is, this sort of phenomenon is not something that is even um, uh, 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 confined just to the particle physics realm. For instance, um, the, a similar sort of thing happens in superconductors. So you may, in your undergraduate courses, have come across super, superconductivity. And you recall in superconductivity, what happens is that the, the electrons in, in, in the superconductor above the critical temperature are just floating around, behaving sort of like uh, metal. But then when you go below the critical temperature for superconductivity, those um, electrons have uh, interactions with the surrounding material, with the phonons in the surrounding material, essentially, which make the electrons want to be closer together. They sort of create a potential energy where it's actually better for them if the, the electrons are, are closer together. So it's sort of like what we would call a confining, uh, confining force emerges. It's a collective phenomenon, but it, but it occurs. And superconductivity occurs because those electron pairs actually condense uh, together in a similar way to these quarks and spontaneously break um, essentially in a, in a non-relativistic line, which they spontaneously break the, the uh, gauge symmetries. So this is not something that just occurs in, in QCD, but it's actually really quite a generic phenomenon. And what are the physical consequences of this phenomenon? Well, the first is that um, uh, QCD itself breaks electroweak symmetry. This is a little known fact, uh, not little known to practicing theorists, but I think little known um, to many of us when we've just had our first sort of standard model courses or we've maybe read a couple of textbooks about quantum field theories and so on. But I think it's a very revealing fact. I think it's a useful one to discuss, even though you're never going to have any practical use for this. So, um, Take, for instance, you know, these all the doublet Q that we've discussed and UC. If it has a non zero expectation value, or for instance, DC and Q has a non zero expectation value, what happens? Well, it, you will recall from the Lagrangian of the standard model that these guys interact with the Higgs, and these guys interact with the Higgs. But the, the whole thing in the Lagrangian has to be gauge invariant. What that means is that these combinations have the same quantum numbers, gauge quantum numbers, as, uh, as the Higgs. So the, the, the uh, magnitude of the hypercharge of this pair of things is a half. And they are in doublets or anti doublets of um, SU2 uh, symmetry. Now, we, we remember what happened when an SU2 doublet got a non-zero expectation value from when we studied electric symmetry breaking with the Higgs. And the same sort of thing is happening here. So when that happened, we saw the W and the Z got a mass. The, the Goldstone bosons, the longitudinal components of the Higgs, got eaten to become the, the longitudinal components of the Ws and Zs. And the only symmetry that was left over was, uh, was QED. That was the only thing that hadn't been broken. Well, the same thing happens just as a result of QCD as well. We never talk about it because it's happening in a much lower energy scale. This vacuum expectation value of the Higgs 
in these units is, is like 246 uh, GeV, whereas here, this is more like hundreds of MeV. So it's a tiny, tiny contribution to the W and uh, Z masses. Essentially immeasurable, but nonetheless, it's there. And the QQ bar condensate has a scale which we normally associate with this quantity F pi, which we call like the, the pi on decay constant. It's the, the core equivalent of V for the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. And this is around uh, 130 MeV squared. Um, so what this means is that imagine a universe without the Higgs doublet. Right? Imagine a standard model without the Higgs doublet. In that universe, you, uh, you, know, you couldn't write down the Yukawa interactions and things like this, but also there'd be no electric symmetry breaking from, the, from a Higgs sector. And you don't even need to go that far. Imagine there's a Higgs doublet, but it has a positive mass squared. So this, the Mexican hat potential never turns over and it's just um, like a, 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 a sort of a, a rotated parabola. Well, in that case, then um, one, you might be tempted to think, well, the W and Z boson would be massless because there was no Higgs or the Higgs didn't get a vacuum expectation value. But no, in fact, um, QCD would have done the job for us. QCD would have broken electric symmetry for us alone. And the W mass, for instance, um, would have been, uh, no, I mean, instead of GV, it would have been something like GF pi. So I don't know what that is, probably something around like um, 80 MeV or something like that. Well, actually, yeah, I'm not so far off. Uh, yeah, about three orders of magnitude below um, uh, the value of the W mass that we know of. And similarly, MZ would have been something like G prime squared plus G squared to the half F pi. Um, now, this is not super useful for you, but I'm, I'm hoping now to just describe some things to you that are just interesting, intellectually interesting, and, and, and um, develop your intuition for, for the standard model and quantum field theories. And this is a super neat fact, in my opinion. Um, okay. Uh, there are also one thing that you may have heard of. So, so clearly, we could have done electric symmetry breaking with the Higgs, and that's what nature chose, but there's another route. And you may have heard of a theory, class of theories called Technicolor. And in these Technicolor theories, this is basically the, the physical principle underneath it. The idea is that, well, you just take complete inspiration from nature and say, well, what if those, um, uh, it's not like the quarks and gluons, <coughs> not the standard model that break electric symmetry breaking, less described here. But what if there are new quarks and gluons that are associated with some new gauge group that have the same charges under electric symmetry. And they condense, not really affecting QCD or anything like that, but they condense at some high energy scale, maybe like one TeV. Then similarly, instead of a QCD, QCD scale of a GeV-ish would have a TeV, then F pi for those new quarks would be around say 130 GeV, and you could have broken electric symmetry breaking. You could have achieved electric symmetry breaking in that way, and that's what's known as as technicolor. And that's why uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson is sort of well, technicolor was already sort of ruled out anyway from precision measurements at LEP, the LEP collider at CERN. But furthermore, the, 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 the discovery of the Higgs boson was like the final nail in the coffin for that class of theories, because just like in, in, in this example here, there would be no light Higgs-like particle really um, uh, uh, lying around. You, know, you might have some, uh, uh, oh, by the way, so the, the pions here would have been eaten by the gauge bosons to become their longitudinal modes. So you'd no, not really have a Higgs-like particle lying around. There's one particle that would be sort of quasi similar to it called the sigma, but that would be very heavy. It'd be cl close to the, the mass scale of um, the, the, the scale generated by dimensional transmutation. So that sigma would have been like more like 800 GeV or something like this, not um, 125 GeV. Okay, so that's just a little point of interest. Um, now we're gonna go and take some of the ideas that we developed and calculate it a little bit more. So I've said that quarks condensate, quarks condense. Um, but now we're going to step back into the real world where there is a standard model Higgs. The quarks got masses from electric symmetry breaking, which occurred, you know, at the, the, the 100, T, 100 GeV scale. And we're going to calculate some properties or at least estimate some properties of 
physics below the QCD scale. And the first thing to uh, uh, start discussing in a little bit more detail um, is the physics of the, the physics of pions. Okay, so pions you will probably be familiar with. They're, they're mesons. They're spin one pseudoscalars made up of a quark and an anti-quark. Um, and to consider them, think about the, the first generation. So just the up and down quarks. And also for, for now, we're going to, at the moment, but not at the end, at the moment, we're going to forget about the, the uh, quark masses. So under QCD, and we have a pair of three bars, which is UC and DC. And we have a pair of three. So the fundamental representations is like a vector of color, which is the two things that live in Q, which is the quark doublet. But because we're well below the electric symmetry breaking scale, it doesn't really make sense to package these things into electroweak doublets anymore uh, necessarily. We're thinking the symmetry structure is slightly uh, uh, less constrained. So we have uh, UL and DL. So these are the things that would have lived in that big Q. And indeed, not based on, on electroweak symmetry, but just based on, um, although it's, it, it works that way, but just based on the fact that if we're forgetting the masses, then these, all we have are the kinetic terms. And if we only have the kinetic terms, we actually have a symmetry where we could rotate these amongst one another. And so we can actually package the, the anti-quarks in a field that I'll call big QC, so call it UC and DC, and the quarks in big Q that you know already, UL and DL. And then in the limit of uh, vanishing quark masses, the Lagrangian is just the kinetic terms and up to differences with respect to electromagnetism, because they have different charges. That's the only uh, uh, fly in the ointment. But apart from that, um, with respect to QCD, the kinetic terms are invariant under a symmetry where we rotate, for example, UL, DL, doublet, the Q, goes to, let's call it VL, UL, DL. And UC DC goes to, I'll write it um, just for sake notation. I'll write it in the transposed form. So UC, UC DC goes to UC DC times V right. I'm choosing the way, the, the format for this just so that you can imagine contracting these two together in a second. So this is just a unitary rotation, that's all we're doing. So this is a two by two unitary matrix, and this is a different two by two unitary matrix. And in matrix language, we're just uh, rotating these by some, some amount, according to that unitary matrix, and these, but I put it in transposed format, so it's a column vector. Sorry, so it's a, a row vector, these are column vectors. And these are different unitary matrices. So if you write down the kinetic terms, which you've already seen, so you can just stare at them yourself, um, you can see that these are symmetries of uh, the kinetic terms in the Lagrangian, the pieces with the space-time derivatives. And so at the level of the kinetic terms, there is a big, big symmetry, which we'll say I've called SU2 left cross SU2 uh, right symmetry. However, the quarks condense. So when they condense, right after, after condensation, when they condense, we have that UCU plus DCD is not equal to zero. But this combination here is simply Q, C, dot Q. That's what you see, U plus D, C, D is. Okay, so what's the punchline? Well, so the theory has a big global symmetry, which is SU2 left cross SU2 right. However, the vacuum, which is like the Higgs mechanism again, the vacuum spontaneously breaks that symmetry. Now, these are global symmetries, so uh, um, we expect when there's spontaneous symmetry breaking that there's going to be massless Goldstone bosons. Um, if they were gauged, then that those Goldstone bosons would become the longitudinal components of some gauge fields, but they're not gauged, they're global symmetries. So 
When we've spontaneously broken the symmetry, this symmetry here down to some lower symmetry, um, we will expect Goldstone bosons. But how many? To determine how many Goldstone bosons there, are, there will be, we need to determine what symmetries have actually been broken. And you can see that this object here is actually still invariant. So let's do, try and do independently an SU2 left and an SU2 right. This object here is not invariant independently. However, if we perform um, a rotation where VL is equal to V right dagger, then um, this theory is here to be right. Then um, this object here is actually invariant. So if this guy has condensed to give a non-zero uh, uh, value for this combination here, that symmetry is still unbroken. So there is an SU2 symmetry remaining. We call this symmetry SU2 uh, vector. Um, now the orthogonal symmetry, the, the other one, which would be VL is equal to V right, Let's call it SU2, call it SU2 axial, um, because of, just because of the way it, 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 uh, it operates on the quarks. Um, this thing here is actually uh, broken, spontaneously broken by the, back, by the expectation value for this combination. Okay, so we start off with two SU2 symmetries. You can see that we still have one remaining, just from looking at this, um, but we've lost one. So that means one of them has been broken by the quark common state. Okay, so we start off with two SU2 symmetries. Each SU2 symmetry, if you recall, um, has three generators. And, um, but in the vacuum, we only have one of the SU2 symmetries. So we've lost three generators. Three generators have, have been broken. Uh, uh, three generators that generate the, the SU2 symmetry have been, have, uh, uh, we say that they don't annihilate the vacuum. And so we expect three exactly massless Goldstone bosons. So we expect three uh, massless Goldstone bosons. I should note, I, I mentioned this in, in, in the relevant lecture, but um, sometimes we call them Nambu Goldstone bosons, not just Goldstone bosons, because Nambu did. Um, related work at the at the same time, I think they, I think they were not so aware of each other's work, um, but I'm not sure. Okay, so we've worked in this sort of slightly um, idealized Lagrangian where there's no quark masses, and in that slightly idealized Lagrangian, we see that we have just because of quark condensation, which was because of asymptotic freedom, and um, uh, we should have three massless Goldstone bosons. We're getting close to looking like nature here because indeed the pions are pretty light, right? They're much lighter than um, uh, the other particles in, in QC. They're much lighter, for instance, than the, the proton and the neutron. And that is a, on its own would be a bit of a puzzle. Um, but we can do even better, okay? Because the pions, because we've been working in this idealized situation with zero quark masses, but of course the masses are, are, are not zero. There is a term in the Lagrangian which includes the quark masses. And it looks, I'm just going to use a little m, we can imagine it with a subscript q or something. Um, because of the Higgs BEV, at around the QCD scale, um, <clears throat> there are quark masses that I'm going to just super schematically write as little m uh, ucu plus dcb. So this object here is QCD gauge invariant and also actually electromagnetic gauge invariant. Um, and so this is just a mass term. So there's two fermions, two fermions. So this is a, a, a mass term and it's a Dirac mass term because this is one valve spinner and a different valve spinner. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there is a quark mass, but we can see that this object is just this object, okay? which means that this object is invariant under SU2 vector, but that was the symmetry that wasn't spontaneously broken. So that isn't so important for us. However, it explicitly breaks SU2 axial. This symmetry here, you know, at the start with just the kinetic terms, we could have done two different SU2 rotations. 
Um, but when we have a mass term, we can't do this type of SO2 rotation. We can only do that type here. So this parameter here, this mass parameter, explicitly breaks the global symmetry. And this is very, very consequential because Goldstone's theorem, which told us we would get mass as particles, really relied on having an exact continuous symmetry. And so if it's not really a symmetry, you won't really get a Goldstone boson. And if the symmetry breaking is big in some, some measure, if that symmetry breaking is big, then you're really, really not going to get a Goldstone boson. On the other hand, you would expect that if the symmetry breaking parameter is small, then you would sort of get a Goldstone boson, but it wouldn't be massless. Um, and this is, is, is indeed what happens because we know, because this M parameter here, the quark mass, and I'm assuming that the up and down quark masses are identical here just for simplicity, but you don't need to do that and you get the same result. But M is the only parameter in the, the in the theory that is breaking this, this um, global symmetry explicitly. And so, if I were to study this theory and imagine how it behaves, if I were to change the parameters, if I set M, if M were to go to zero, then I must recover an exactly mass of Goldstone boson because I've recovered an exact symmetry. So in the limit that M is zero, the Goldstone mass is zero, the pion mass is zero. And um, by the way, these three massless Goldstone bosons would be the pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. Um, which means then that somehow the mass squared of the pion must be proportional to M in some way. And we can just make a super dumb estimate. So let's assume that the pion mass squared is proportional to M. And then we need, if it's proportional to M, then we need to make up uh, just dimensionally, we need to make up um, the mass square of some other parameter. And let's just call it what I call it, lambda pi which is some other parameter with dimensions of mass. It's not the, the VEV of the pions, which is the reason why I sort of went to length, at length to emphasize the difference between dimensions and coupling dimensions, because really F pi is not a mass field. There's no particle that has mass F pi. Uh, but this thing here, this is mass squared on the side, because the first thing that enters in the Lagrangian for a scalar is, the, is a mass squared. It's not a mass parameter, but a mass squared parameter. So it's mass squared, but the quark mass isn't something else. But that something else is not going to be something like f pi. It has to be a mass parameter. And the best guess for this uh, thing here would be something like um, some coupling. Let's call it g star times f pi. And g star is some underlying coupling in the theory. So if it's like a QCD-ish coupling, then this is uh, big. If alpha QCD were sort of uh, um, uh, one, then that would mean that the g star is, uh, uh, sorry, if, if alpha QCD, QC over four pi, which is the typ typical size of, of a loop correction. If that were one, then that would say that the G QCD is of, of order sort of four pi at that scale. So then we can estimate that M pi squared would be something like M, where M is the quark masses, times four pi, times 130 MeV. Because 130 MeV was, was F pi, G star F pi. And indeed, for if if uh, M, M, which is the quark mass, I should have done MQ. I knew that at the time. I don't know why I did it. didn't do it. If M was around 10 MeV, for instance, then we would get that M pi, just by inserting that in here, would be around like 125 MeV. And that's really not so bad. The pion mass is more like 140 MeV. And the quark masses are more like somewhere, I think, between like four and eight MeV. Um, but this is not a bad estimate. And so we're really using the, all of these tools, right? We're using the coupling, the dimension, you know, coupling dimensional analysis. We're using spontaneous symmetry breaking Goldstone's theorem. We're using the notion of approximate symmetries. And we put all this together, and we can actually get a pretty good extraction of what the sort of fundamental quark mass should be, sort of around the 10 MeV scale if you're going to get the pion mass uh, uh, correct, correctly. And there's also a very important lesson here in terms of the structure of nature, because um, we can see that what, what, what's really occurring here is that 
you know, we have some UV theory, and this is just the standard model above the QCD scale. So it's a theory where it's interacting, it has quarks and gluons. And there's an approximate, I'll write this here, approximate SU2 axial symmetry. I say it's approximate because it's explicitly broken by the quark masses, but the quark masses related to the QCD scale are actually um, very small. Um, so it's a, an approximate SU2 axial symmetry. And then as we go to low energies, we've got the IR theory, which is the theory at long distances, uh, low energy scales, but close to IR. And what emerges because of quark condensation and asymptotic freedom are some pseudo, call them pseudo, that just means they have mass, it's not an exact symmetry, pseudo goldstone bosons. And that's what the pions are. They are really um, uh, uh, pseudo goldstone bosons of a, an approximate continuous global symmetry, which has been spontaneously broken by quark condensation. Now, again, you're not going to need this in any, you know, you're never going to plug, in, plug this into MathGraph and uh, 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 use it to extract some predictions of the LHC or something like that. But I think that this aspect of the standard model, this corner of the standard model, low energies, really shows the concept, or I think really highlights the conceptual advances that have been made in understanding all of these different aspects of, um, of quantum field theories. We've got you know, running of couplings, dimensional, and dimensional transmutation, We've got uh, approximate symmetries, gauge symmetries, um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, go, you know, Goldstone's theorem, um, uh, dimensional analysis, you know, using factors of H bar to see where couplings would go in. All of this stuff packaged together really now uh, helps us understand the predictions at low energies of the standard model in a very useful qualitative way. Of course, this is not quantitative to do that. You put the theory on a lattice, but um, it's, it's very helpful. And also uh, 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 for us, you know, in this UV completion, we have quarks and gluons and, and things like that. And down here we have like pions and rho mesons and protons and neutrons and all that sort of stuff. And it also reveals that it's useful to think about quantum field theories as effective field theories. You know, it, imagine you had only ever discovered or just, you know, uh, uh, studied um, experimentally, that is, physics below the QCD scale. You might be tempted to say, well, there's nothing else to discover, or, um, you know, that the, the, the nature was somehow some complicated theory of. of, of, of of pions and mesons and all this sort of stuff. But in reality, there's a UV completion. There's a theory where that the validity of that theory breaks down and something else lies behind that. You know, it's like sometimes people think of this as being like an onion of nature. You can actually correlate very closely colliders with, with layers of, in, in the past, this is with layers of the onion. And then we go to the UV and there's a different description. It's a description that has actually has fewer parameters and the, the, the symmetry structures are much more manifest than in the IR. And from within that UV completion, we can actually calculate the seemingly fundamental parameters of the IR theory. The, the pion mass in the IR theory looks like just a fundamental parameter. It's not something that can be calculated in the effective theory on its own. Yet, um, it can be calculated in the UV completion, which is a theory of quarks and gluons. You can just put that on a computer and calculate the pion masses or estimate them in this way uh, uh, on a whiteboard. And so this is this really lies behind one of the big structure, structural aspects of, of, of the standard model. When we um, think about it, we know that it breaks down. It's incomplete. You know, dark matter isn't in there. Neutrino masses aren't, uh, aren't predicted, strictly speaking, and, and things like this. But it also breaks down. You know, with, as we go to higher energy scales, there will, the, 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 we can't go to arbitrarily high energy scales without the, the gravitational interactions becoming important. And we don't really have a working theory for that. There's candidates like string theory, but no unique one has been selected out. And, or, or even if you're not worried about that, you know, hypercharge itself becomes strongly uh, uh, interacting. And then there are other puzzles like the strong CP problem and the, the pattern of quark flavors uh, of, of fermion uh, 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 flavors and generations and also 
their masses. And so all of this goes together to, to show that the, the standard model itself is like an effective theory. And we expect it should have some sort of structure that, that is almost like this. It's not really trying to look at the moment like a very fundamental theory. It's, it's very ad hoc. So these, these concepts are also very useful to keep in your mind. I think it's useful to think about Higgs physics and the Higgs sector in a similar way to, as, as for the pions, for instance. Um, although at present, there's no evidence for um, what specifically that higher energy scale is, whereas at the moment, uh, uh, sorry, whereas with, with QCD, you could sort of extract that quite, uh, uh, quite early on. Okay, so there's another place um, I'm going to skip something. So in, if I put these notes online, there'll be something about the eta prime puzzle, where, where the eta prime is a um, <clears throat> an expected Goldstone boson, because we have uh, this thing here actually is respecting another global symmetry that I didn't, didn't tell you about, which is a, um, an axial symmetry. And we would have expected a Goldstone boson to be uh, associated with that axial symmetry, and it's not. So there should, we would have expected a, a fourth pion, and we don't get that uh, for a very interesting reason, which is related to, the, to anomalies. So the, the, um, uh, that symmetry is actually anomalous under QCD. And so if the path, even though classically the Lagrangian has the symmetry, the path integral breaks the symmetry. And um, in QCD, because the coupling is large, the quantum effects are important. And so we expect those effects to be important, the affection, the, the, the anomalous, the anomaly to be important, and indeed they are. The, the eta prime meson, which was meant to be light, if you just think classically, actually is, uh, is much, much heavier and that's as a, re a result of anomalies. But then the last thing I want to talk about is to keep it with, um, keep it uh, to pions and discuss pion decays. Pion decays are another place where um, there's some really interesting quantum physics going on. So the first thing I will discuss, which is very simple, um, is charge pion decays. So how, how should the charge pion decay? Well, there's no other hadronic stuff to decay into because the, the pions are the lightest hadrons. So anything it decays into has to be electromagnetic or leptonic. Um, and the obvious uh, uh, things to decay through because it's charged would be through a, a W boson, any QCD interactions uh, through like involving um, uh, uh, other hadrons are not going to give us a decay because we can't have any hadrons on this side. So we have to have something that talks to the electromagnetic sector. And that means we have to go through the through QED or the electroweak sector. And if it's charged on the left-hand side, it's charged on, it'll be charged on the right-hand side, and it'll be charged in between. So it will have to involve, them, involve an electroweak thing that's charged. And the obvious candidate is uh, the charged W boson, which would decay to a lepton and a neutrino. OK, so what are the rates? Well, we recall from when we studied um, uh, the electroweak sector that this coupling in here, so I'm just doing arrow. Is proportional to the Yukawa of the lepton, which will be proportional to the mass of the lepton. And what this means is that it will decay, you expect it will decay to muons very differently than it would decay, for example, to, to electrons. Now, the pion muon mass difference isn't that big. I don't know what it is, like 35 MeV or something like this. Um, so there are additional factors to, to consider, but at a first, at first blush, You'd expect that the, the rate of decays to electrons versus the rate of decays to muons, so I'll, I'll denote this in this way, would go something like y electron squared over y muon squared, or these are the Yukawa couplings. And what this means is that it goes something like m electron over m muon all squared. If the muon was much, much lighter than the, than the pion, so that phase space uh, is unimportant, then that is what you would expect. But actually, um, we have to, to integrate over phase space, and we have to recall that this thing here, this decay width, is going to be going like the, the, the Yukawa squared. But then there's also going to be a 1 over mw to the 4 from the propagator of the, uh, um, from the, propagator of the, the, the W boson. 
it also decay widths have to mass dimension one, so there will be something at mass dimension one, which is proportional to the total energy available, which will just be the pion mass. And then the phase space interval, because um, uh, if you rec will recall from your calculations of, of, of cross sections and um, decay rates, uh, the phase space matters. And the lepton in the muon case is very close in mass to, to the mass of the pion. So there's not a huge amount of phase space remaining. And we, if the lepton was identical mass to the, to the pion, we'd expect that map, the phase space to completely vanish. Um, and as before, quantities go that are relativistically invariant don't go like the square root of the invariant mass of an object, they go like the invariant mass of an object. So we expect this to be a function of m pi squared and m nu squared. And indeed, it will become like something like m pi squared minus m lepton squared, all squared, because dimensionally I've got an m pi in here and I've got, so I've got four dimensional parameters to, to kill off. Then I'll have a, a, something with mass dimension to the four in the numerator. So this is a, a good guess. So overall, we expect that the rate will go like the Yukawa's, the ratio of Yukawa squared, also multiplied by the phase space factor, which is um, a non-negligible uh, correction for um, m pi squared minus m u squared for the muons. And this uh, comes out at like 10 to the minus four or so, um, which meets the expectations. So you see the pions, absolutely love to, charge pions love to decay to muons. If you want a muon, get a pion, um, because that is, is uh, uh, the thing that it uh, uh, will pr predominantly decay to. Electrons, not so much, not a fun. Okay, and five more minutes. I, uh, let's discuss the uh, neutral pion. I'll come back to black marker here. So pi zero. Uh, okay, so the pions are CP odd, but they're actually C even. Um, <clears throat> so they could decay in principle consistent with C symmetry to two photons. So you, you could in principle have something like this. If you imagine inside you've got a, a U bar and a U and a D bar and a D, but let's just imagine it's U bar U. You could have some decay with some stuff um, and it goes to uh, this. Something like uh, two photons. It is allowed. Um, but what would the rate be? So the photons are masses, so we can forget about any worries about uh, phase space and things like this. However, um, there's no one over MW to the four or anything like that. So there's no electroweak stuff necessarily going through there. But then how can we how can we estimate it? Because essentially we would just have the pion mass multiplying some uh, coupling. But what would that coupling be? Well, it turns out if you were to do this in a very dumb manner, so I'm going to, I want this to be a blob, because we don't really know what's going on in here. So let this be a blob. If you were to do this in a sort of a very naive and dumb manner, we would say, well, uh, here's the Lagrangian. There'll be some, um, the neutral pion isn't charged, so it can't couple like uh, through a covariant derivative because it doesn't carry any charge. So the lowest, coupling that you could write, the, 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 the most relevant coupling that you could write down is the lowest dimension one. And it would be something like um, pi zero over F pi, because pi zero has units of field, which is the same as a decay constant. Then something like it's CP odds, so we have to have F mu nu, this is the photon field strength, F tilde mu nu, so this is CP invariant map, this is CP odd and this is CP odd. And what are the numbers out front? Well. Any interaction with the photon is going to be proportional to, in some way or another, to the electric charge. If we were to send the electric charge to the QD gauge coupling to zero, the photon would not interact with anything. So whatever's going on in here, there has to be uh, 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 a couple of factors of charge. And if it's generated at one loop, there'd be an H bar. So there'd be two factors of the electromagnetic uh, gauge coupling. So we would expect something like alpha electromagnetism over four pi. What is it? Or two pi, sorry. 2 pi. And then in here, some number c. And we don't know what it is. OK. But if you recall, going way back when to the, to the Goldstones again, um, the, the 
pions, if they if the SU2 axial symmetry were an exact symmetry, then the pions would have a shift symmetry. That's what enforces the masslessness of those of those pions, if you recall, way back when we were doing spontaneously broken symmetries. But this interaction here is explicitly breaking the shift symmetry. So fundamentally, underneath everything, there must be some in, in the coefficient, there must be some memory of the fact that that shift symmetry was um, broken. And the only thing that broke it was the quark masses. And that's the only reason that the pion had mass. The mass squared is proportional to the quark mass times essentially the QCD scale. So we would expect this parameter C in here would be something like m pi squared over, because uh, that's proportional to the quark masses, over something of order the QCD scale. So let's do something like m proton squared. But you could you could trade that for, for your favorite QCD scale parameter. OK, so if you do this, um, you see that, number one, you do expect the pion to decay to two photons. Sometimes people say you don't expect the pions to decay to two photons. That's just false. You do. Um, but you expect the rate, you know, just, just estimating it in this way, would be something like the rate of pi zero to two photons would be something like uh, two times 10 to the 13 uh, inverse seconds. Okay, but the observed rate, is uh, of order 10 to the 60 inverse seconds. Okay, so what has gone wrong? This seemed like a fairly sensible uh, estimate. We used all of the ingredients that we thought we had, right? This spontaneous symmetry breaking, it breaks the shift symmetry, so there has to be a power of the quark masses somehow, because that's the only parameter that breaks the shift symmetry. Uh, dimensional analysis tells us that this should be F pi, and at most, it's going to involve uh, something like H bar. So the, 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 because it's a quantum, it will be a quantum effect because the, the pions are neutral and they don't couple to photons in the covariant derivatives. So we get something like this. Maybe the two pi could have been wrong, like two, four pi or eight pi or something. But that's not the three orders of magnitude that's gone wrong here. What has gone wrong is um, that, in fact, the global symmetry um, that was spontaneously broken, this SU2, the, 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 the diagonal bit of this SU2 axial symmetry is actually anomalous. If you were to uh, uh, study the, the, the transformation of the path integral, you can do this in the UV completion, which is the theory of the quarks and gluons, you find out that this is um, an anomalous symmetry. So the quantum theory does not respect the theory that's spontaneously broken to give you the pi, uh, to give you the pi on mass at the level of the electromagnetic interactions. So that's where the anomaly is. The eta prime that I was telling you about was an anomaly related to QCD. But this is an anomaly related to, quant to electromagnetism, to QED. And so because there's an anomaly, there's no need for this coefficient to involve powers of the quark masses, because we've, the only reason we used that was that the quark masses were the only parameters that break the symmetry explicitly. But now we don't even need to need that, because the, the, um, the, the path integral itself is quantum mechanically breaking the symmetry because of the, the anomaly. And so this C parameter can actually be of order uh, one. And when you do that, you get uh, an estimate if this is one of order, I think it was something like four times 10 to the 60, which for someone like me is bang on. Um, <clears throat> you will may recognize this, so this is known as the adler bell jacquif anomaly. You can think about it in terms of the, the, the SU2 axial uh, uh, current, um, which you can create using the, the neutral pion, the neutral pion insertion, here's two photons. And this triangle diagram doesn't vanish, and as I told you before, these triangle diagrams actually give you the full result for, the, the, uh, for what the anomaly gives you. So the punchline, again, this is using the tools and things that we've seen in the, the previous lectures. The punchline is that anomalies are real. They're real physics. They're not um, something confined to the, the office of a theorist who uh, likes to calculate um, uh, the properties of bizarre theories that don't have any application to, to anything else. Anomalies are very, very much real. Even the fact that the pion decays to two photons so fast um, uh, is the result of an anomaly. OK, uh, that was sort of the last application of some of the, 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 the physics we learned in the earlier sets of the lectures. 
Okay, so that um, finishes today's lecture on physics below the QCD scale. Our next lecture will be the last one, and I'm going to sort of try as best I can to um, walk through a landscape of ideas that look beyond the standard model. The standard model is not complete, and we have a lot of work to do to, to figure out what the true nature of uh, the laws of nature are. And so I'm going to try and touch on a variety of topics that you may uh, encounter in your research in particle physics um, and hopefully demystify some jargon and give you some of the conceptual ideas that are related to those, uh, those topics.